On the 14th of June 2023, I went to go see the new Ari Aster movie Bo is Afraid. I went with a friend and watched it at the Tyneside Cinema in Newcastle, England. My favourite cinema to watch films that are unsettling, thought-provoking and timeless. I have only seen a handful of movies in this cinema, but every time I've left it satisfied. Bo is Afraid was no exception to the rule. In fact, I think it's one of the best films I've seen at that cinema. It only falls short at Bong Joon-ho's 2019 film, Parasite. Now typically, a movie like Bo is Afraid wouldn't necessarily get my attention due to its reputation as, well, mental. The art I tend to consume usually can be summed up like this, condensed and compact. Don't get me wrong, I'm always willing to step outside this well-defined box. However, instinctually, I do tend to find myself gravitating towards books and movies that are minimal, don't overstay their welcome, and can be rewatched or reread with differing interpretations, contexts, and views each time. Take, for example, a film like Damien Chazelle's Whiplash, or a book like Graham Greene's The End of the Affair. Both works are quite simple on the surface, yet upon rewatches and reads can be appreciated in various ways. And so, it was with a strong sense of surprise that I left a film as chaotic as Bo is Afraid with a smile on my face. And this surprise began to make me question something. Why do I always shy away from surrealist art? The surrealists have always been hit or miss for me, and rarely hit at that. I have tried numerous times to include directors and writers into my artistic palette who incorporate surrealist elements into their works, but I often lose interest. Writers like Thomas Pinchon or Haruki Murakami hooked me initially, only to lose me when the weird stuff comes. Similarly, with a director like David Lynch, I enjoyed aspects of his work but felt myself losing interest when it gets nonsensical. I thought maybe I was doing something wrong, and I simply wasn't getting it, which led to this video, an exploration of the origins of surrealism and what it all means. I theorise that by the end of my research, I'll finally be able to consume the likes of Murakami, Pinchon and Lynch from a new angle, a surrealist angle. Appreciation naturally will follow. What I have learned is that there first has to be an eradication of your black and white reasoning and logical mind. You have to understand how not to understand if you are to appreciate these books and films. Just ride that surrealist wave without any pushback or attempt at navigation. It is almost like there is a particular type of mood you have to be in. A mood that, for me, appears maybe two to three times a year. A mood in which my mind decides that it is willing to not be so rigid in its thinking. It is in this mood I'll grab the nearest surrealist work, and it is in this mood that I bring you this video. To understand the origins of surrealism, we first need to understand the origins of the man who pioneered it, André Breton. André Breton was born on the 18th of February 1896 in Tonchebray, Normandy, France. As a child, Breton soon moved from Tonchebray to a Parisian suburb where he was to spend his formative years. In his adolescence, Breton would develop an interest in psychiatry and subsequently would soon begin to study medicine and psychiatry at a nearby medical school. Breton was fascinated by psychiatric disorders and not long into his studies would be given the opportunity to witness the effects of such disorders up close as the arrival of World War I pulled him out of his school and straight into a military hospital in Nantes where he came face to face with injured and shell-shocked soldiers. It was in this military hospital where Breton would meet a man that would leave a lasting impression on Breton for the rest of his life. In early 1916, a man by the name of Jacques Fouché would be transported to Nantes after suffering a calf wound whilst on the front lines. At this time, Breton was 20 years old. Breton would attend to Vachet's wounds, and the two would soon develop a strong friendship. Breton would later describe Vachet in an essay written between 1917 to 1923 that was only published until the late 1960s. A year older than me, he was a young man with red hair very elegant, who had taken with Mr. Luke Oliver Merson at the School of Fine Arts. Confined to bed, he spent his time drawing and painting, a series of postcards for which he created some unusual captions. Masculine fashion was almost always the target of his imagination. He liked these smooth-faced figures, an aloof behaviour that one could observe in bars. Every morning, he would spend a good hour arranging one or two photographs, jars and a few violets on a little table with a lace tablecloth within arm's reach. 
Breton had taken to Vache due to Vache's embodiment of what Breton supposedly was not. Vache was confident, humorous, and instinctual, whereas Breton was quiet, serious, and intellectual. After recovering from his calf wound, Fiché was sent back to the front lines, where he and Breton would correspond until the end of the war in 1918. Fiché's writing during this time would further inspire Breton, and he would give Fiché the highest praises when writing about him in later years. Fiché's writing, thoughts on the absurdity of the war, and eccentric nature became Breton's first inspiration for surrealism. Ironically, the next great influence on Breton would appear in the form of yet another injured frontline soldier, whose name was Guillaume Apollinaire. Breton and Apollinaire had been in correspondence with one another since 1915, when Breton sent Apollinaire some poems he had written, to which Apollinaire responded positively. Yet, it wouldn't be until the 10th of May 1916, when Breton visited Apollinaire, who had suffered a head injury. This injury would mark the end of Apollinaire's military career, but the beginning of a lifelong friendship with Breton. Apollinaire's contribution to the emerging surrealist mind of Breton would begin with the term itself. On the 18th of May 1917, when writing out the programme note for a ballet by the name of Parade, Apollinaire used the term surrealism to describe the mashup of art forms the ballet included. He said that these art forms had given rise in Parade to a kind of surrealism. In my view, this is just the first of many manifestations of the new spirit, now abroad. We may expect it to bring about profound changes in our arts and manners through universal joyfulness. Inspired by this manifestation of the new spirit, Apollinaire would later use the term to describe an avant-garde play of his own, which was performed on the 24th of June 1917, in attendance with Breton and Vache. On the programme note, Apollinaire had deployed his new favourite term, and defined it as an artistic tendency which, if it is no more new than anything else under the sun, has nevertheless not been used to describe any artistic or literary credo or affirmation. Apollinaire then gives an example for surrealism, which had been given to him by Breton. When man wanted to imitate walking, he invented the wheel, which does not look like a leg, without knowing it, he was a surrealist. The aforementioned experiences of Breton contributed to the forming of surrealism, yet the emergence did not occur within a vacuum. It had instead been just another chain in the long link of artistic evolution, and the artistic link that had preceded surrealism was Dadaism. Dadaism was formed in the early 20th century and was a reaction against the horrors experienced in World War I. The Dada movement had sought to fight back against the same logic and reason that had dragged these young men into war. Thus, the works of these associated with the movement were negative, nihilistic, and anarchic reactions against the atrocities witnessed by the creators. Breton, who had no doubt witnessed plenty of atrocities himself, was at one point all for the movement. However, over time, he felt himself slipping away from the formless feel of Dadaism and sought to find a new, programmatic and positive answer to Dadaism's nihilistic ways. He didn't want to associate with the reactionary art of Dadaism, he instead wanted something that was introspective. This, of course, was Surrealism, the latest exercise in artistic non-conformity, and Breton would seek to lay out the requirements of this new movement in 1924, when he published Manifestos of Surrealism. Breton's Manifestos of Surrealism would lay the groundwork for the true meaning of the term and movement. He begins the manifesto by describing a man, whom Breton calls an inveterate dreamer, who has been neglectful of his imagination and has hit the middle of his life feeling entirely dissatisfied with almost everything. His financial situation, his affairs, and his work have all fallen under the umbrella of unimpressive. Feeling this way, the man, who fortunately still retains some lucidity, looks back on the most formless section of his life, his childhood. It is in this section that he looks back with a feeling of charm. According to Breton, this charm the man feels correlates to the absence of any known restrictions. With this absence, the man is granted the perspective to live numerous lives at once. Breton then continues to explain how our personal allowance of how far we enable our imagination to expand gets narrower the older we get. It is around our 20th year that all imagination is abandoned. In this manifesto, Breton seeks to reawaken the imagination he believed so many of us had abandoned. 
He wants to inspire the many he believes to be misusing their freedom of thought. Among all the many misfortunes to which we are heir, it is only fair to admit that we are allowed the greatest degree of freedom of thought. It is up to us not to misuse it, to reduce the imagination to a state of slavery. Even though it would mean the elimination of what is commonly called happiness, is to betray all sense of absolute justice within oneself. Breton then makes mention of the mad, whom Breton believes to be victims of their imagination, due to their imagination encouraging them to disregard any rules that most people are raised to follow and respect. This perceived madness may lead to an individual's public ridicule or incarceration. However, according to Breton, this madness simultaneously acts to ignore these outside factors, as the supposedly mad individual finds immense comfort and consolation from their imagination, thus allowing them to enjoy their madness, because it enables them to endure the thought that its validity does not extend beyond themselves. For the average person, we cannot relate to this comfort and consolation in everyday life. However, we can find it in the one place where the imagination is let loose in our adult lives, in dreams. Dreams are the key to the unfiltered imagination. However, that is a topic I will expand upon later. For the time being, just know that it is this emerging of dreams with reality, within art, that Breton had sought to accomplish, thus creating surrealism. Breton had thus wanted to try and tap into the mind's thoughts and imagination, and do whatever he could to produce the thoughts as they are onto the page. He defines surrealism as such. Surrealism, psychic automatism in its pure state, by which one proposes to express, verbally, by means of the written word, or in any other manner, the actual functioning of thought, dictated by thought, in the absence of any control exercised by reason, exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern. The end of the first section of the manifesto mentions the many poets from the past who unknowingly included surrealist elements in their work. Some of these artists include William Shakespeare, Arthur Rimbaud, and the Marquise de Sade, and many more. However, Breton argues that all the writers he mentions do not fall entirely into the surrealist category. This is due to them holding onto naive preconceived notions and not allowing their pride to get out of the way. Unfortunately for them, Breton does not view these writers as consistent producers of harmonious sound, due to them never truly learning the surrealist voice. They never heard the voice that continues to preach on the eve of death and above the storms, quite like the true integrators of surrealism had. Better luck next time, I guess. Under the pretense of civilization and progress, we have managed to banish from the mind everything that may rightly or wrongly be termed superstition or fancy. Forbidden is any kind of search of truth which is not in conformance with accepted practices. It was, apparently, by pure chance, that a part of our mental world which we pretended not to be concerned with any longer and in my opinion by far the most important part, has been brought back to light. For this we must give thanks to the discoveries of Sigmund Freud. Like Freud, Breton believed that dreams provided a window into a man or woman's wants and desires. However, whilst Freud had used these dreams to help psychoanalyze patients experiencing mental disorders, Breton had suggested that dreams could be used for creative inspiration. Dreams were thus a manifestation of the unconscious, the thoughts and the emotions that we are unaware of. Breton's merging of dreams and writing were thus an expression of our unconscious thoughts, the thoughts of which Breton believed to be capable of inspiring far more beautiful forms of art than the conscious mind ever could. I have always been amazed at the way an ordinary observer lends so much more credence and attaches so much more importance to waking events than to those occurring in dreams. But how do you reach the unconscious mind? Breton believed that the best way to reach the unconscious mind was to produce your art at the speed of your thought process, with no regard for form or style. This new form of creation would later be called automatism, or automatic writing, and Breton would approach his friend Philippe Soupol and encourage him to give it a go with him. The two thus got writing. They didn't know what it was or what it all meant. The important part was to just write whatever came to mind. This is what Breton had to say about the conclusion of this writing. By the end of the first day, we were able to read to ourselves some 50 or so pages obtained in this manner and begin to compare our results. 
All in all, Supol's pages and mine proved to be remarkably similar. The same overconstruction, shortcomings of a similar nature, but also, on both our parts, the illusion of an extraordinary verve, a great deal of emotion, a considerable choice of images of a quality such that we would not have been capable of preparing a single one in longhand, a very special picturesque quality, and, here and there, a strong comical effect. Whilst the anecdote provided in the manifesto details the very beginning of Breton and Supol's foray into automatic writing, what it doesn't go into in detail is the book that would subsequently come from these sessions. The book in question was The Magnetic Fields, published in 1920. The Magnetic Fields is the first ever literary work of surrealism, and was written entirely with the automatic writing technique. Every chapter is simply one burst of what reads as nonsensical writing. Whenever either Breton or Supol chose to stop writing, the chapter would end. The end result was a book that to many would seem pointless or gibberish, but to Breton and Supol, the book was an expression of both of their subconscious thoughts, of which they were impartial interlocutors. But back to the manifesto. Breton also leaves a section called Secrets of the Magical Surrealist Art, in which he explains to the reader how they too can produce works of surrealism. After you have settled yourself in a place as favourable as possible to the concentration of your mind upon itself, have writing materials brought to you. Put yourself in as passive or receptive a state of mind as you can. Forget about your genius, your talents, and the talents of everyone else. Keep reminding yourself that literature is one of the saddest roads that leads to everything. Write quickly, without any preconceived subject. Fast enough so that you will not remember what you're writing and be tempted to reread what you have written. The first sentence will come spontaneously. So compelling is the truth that with every passing second there is a sentence unknown to our consciousness which is only crying out to be heard. For the remainder of the manifesto, Breton continues to explain the benefits and theories behind automatic writing before displaying soluble fish. Another exercise in automatism. Soluble fish is just like the magnetic fields, except it was written by Breton alone. Breton ends the manifesto, prior to getting into soluble fish, with a reminder of the importance of thought, and by proxy, the importance of surrealism. This world is only very relatively in tune with thought, and incidents of this kind are only the most obvious episodes of a war in which I am proud to be participating. Surrealism is the invisible ray, which will one day enable us to win out over our opponents. You are no longer trembling, Carcass. This summer the roses are blue, the wood is of glass, the earth, draped in its verdant cloak, makes as little impression upon me as a ghost. It is living and ceasing to live that are imaginary solutions. Existence is elsewhere. Despite articulating his thoughts on the new artistic movement of surrealism in his first manifesto, Breton would wind up writing a second manifesto which would be published in 1929. At this point in time, surrealism had taken off in various art forms, with some of the most notable of the surrealists being Salvador Dali, Max Ernst, and René Magritte. Yet, Despite the rise in Surrealism's popularity, Breton had felt as if the movement had not gone to plan, as a lot of artists adopted elements of Surrealism, but then moved on to their own thing. Politics had also gotten in the way. Breton would thus retain some bitterness. However, Breton would continue pushing the artistic envelope whilst encouraging others to do the same. But eventually, like his medical studies, his plans would be cut short once again due to the arrival of war, the Second World War, which forced him to return to being a medic in 1939. Two years into service, however, Breton fled for New York, where he began lecturing at universities and did a little travelling. When the war ended, Breton would return to Paris, where he continued his writing. At some unknown spot between the 1940s and 50s, Breton would go on to write a third manifesto on surrealism, yet it would never be published. Breton would remain in Paris right up until his death on the 28th of September 1966. He was 70 years old. Despite all the people he met, the art he saw, as well as the places he had been, no one thing, place or person had had as big an impact on Breton as Jacques Vachet. During Vachet's time in Nantes, he and Breton would go to bars and cinemas frequently in their spare time. When going to cinemas, the two, at Vachet's suggestion, would hop in and out of various screenings, not caring for beginnings and ends, until they found something worth watching. But soon, the fun would come to a stop, and, as mentioned previously, Vachet would be sent back to the front. The two would infrequently correspond with one another, and meet up whenever possible. 
Unfortunately, Fache would pass away not soon after the war in a hotel room in what is believed to be either the 5th or 6th of January 1919. Fache and two others had been out drinking and had returned to one of the other two's hotel rooms. Fache brought opium with him, which all three men tried smoking before ingesting the substance. In the morning, one of the men woke up okay and found the other friend dead. Beside him lay Jax Fache, who was alive but in a bad state. The friend called for a doctor, but despite being attended to, Jax Fache passed away. Breton was heartbroken, and to deal with the loss, he worked on publishing his correspondence with Fache in a book which was called War Letters. In an essay 30 years following Fache's death, Breton would continue praising Fache, the man who he saw as the greatest inspiration behind surrealism. Jacques Fache is not dead. He is suddenly beside me. I don't know how, giving me his news. I recognise him in a doorway. I use some unknown, all-powerful password, which instantly removes all doubt as to his identity. And once again, we freely share that sombre gaiety of his, which marked me so strongly. He disposes of my questions before I can formulate them. They seem so naive. Obviously, I am the only one moved by all this. Or at least, only I fail to hide it. The importance of Breton's manifesto would not be underestimated by future generations. The desire to rid yourself of logic, form, and plain conscious living would find itself propping up in many artists and art forms, from the paintings of Salvador Dali, to the books of Haruki Murakami, to the movies of David Lynch. They all compounded upon one another their influence, which began with Breton's manifesto, and it all culminated, for me at least, in the three hour mindfuck that was Bo is Afraid on that June day. When I started this video, I touched upon my inability to get acquainted with the surreal. For some reason, my mind would very rarely acquiesce to the nonsensical and formless form of films like Eraserhead or books like Kafka on the Shore. Occasionally, the surreal would win me over. I enjoyed Twin Peaks and the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, but it was hard not to see those two as outliers in a long list of disregarded surrealist art. Breton has proven to be a good case study for looking into the reasonings behind what could very easily be flippantly regarded as bollocks. Writing whatever comes to your mind on a page with no edits is not going to be for everyone. However, if you understand the modus operandi behind it, the merging of dreams and reality, and the attempt to fully express your unconscious thoughts, you can at least appreciate the effort, which now I do. Yet, despite Breton displaying the power of the imagination and unconscious mind, I do wish he had gone into how to consume surrealist art. When researching this video, I found it hard to come across a text, interview or quote that could perfectly sum up the answer, but soon I realised that it was stupid of me to expect a logical and solid answer in a domain like surrealism. I realised that the consumption of surrealist art relies on your own instinct, your own emotions, and really, your own perspective. There is no way to get it, in the same way as the next person. It's entirely personal. Therefore, the only conclusion I could come to was to look at surrealist art like you would music. Nobody gives a shit if the lyrics don't make sense, whether the instruments are making the right sound, or how to properly consume it. As long as it sounds good, most people really don't question it. Music is the only art form where the unconscious mind speaks on a regular basis. And so, the next time you decide to watch Mulholland Drive or read 1Q84, treat them like you would music. Understand how not to understand, and simply read or watch it like a shark tearing through water. Absorb the feel, let it wash over you. Try not to question too much, save that for after. Keep going, and allow the artist's unconscious to speak to yours. Do that, and I will too.